is left. Yeah, I'm sorry, Brian. I uh, I never follow our message chats. And the worst thing is when I decide I'm going to catch up, it takes me two hours of scrolling to get through. But Oh, man. Do they talk that much on there? Oh, it's awful. I had to find that it was running down the battery on my watch, so I had to disconnect that from notifications because, uh, you know, it was like a cheerleader conference or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, look at your, you, okay. At the bottom where you have the settings, where you have the, the microphone and stop cam. If you'll look to your right, you should see uh, comments in private chat. You see that? Yeah. The comments is where the audience will comment in the private chat is us. So just FYI. Is this Bump's first time on the show? It is. Hey, Bob. Get some more Good Kentucky. Get some more Kentucky representation here. Yeah. Greetings, Feather. You say some more Kentucky representation. What's the other Kentucky representation? Well, not here today. So you are the only Kentucky okay. representation. It, it, that is not true. Oh, Nick, where are you at? Morgantown, yeah. Kentucky. That's oh, right. Wow. <laughs> I apologize. Right. 20, 30 minutes from Bob McPherson there. That's right. Oh yeah, because you were you had that live uh, broadcast that happened on the news in Kentucky. I got you. Oh, okay, yeah. I'll advertise. Happened. I'll advertise for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you watch? Did you watch that? Cool. I did. I did. Oh man, that was hilarious. That little joke he, he threw at the beginning. <laughs> uh, WNKY forty and Bowling Green guys. If y'all want to look it up, I'm. He there. looked like a natural. Uh, anchor like he needs to be on the show and then at the very end where he he turned and looked at the camera man that was gold that was gold yeah gold jerry <laughs> <laughs> it's like he was trained in theater or something yeah what were you doing on television nick did you hear it? did a uh, tornado almost hit the house or is it civil air patrol uh, it's actually the butler county arts guild <laughs> how about oh. that yeah. oh well that's different uh, all the things I was expecting, that wasn't it. Yeah. It was the ballet concert I was at. Yeah, that just you, you know, Brian, if you would if you would pay attention to the private chats, you would know what it's about. All right. I probably would. I know. I know. Here we go, go man. Go ahead and mute. And welcome to the Answer Religious Era Show. My name is Brian Garlock, and I'm your host. This is our live Bible Q&A. If you have a Bible question, now is the time to ask that question. You can email us, questions at answeringreligiousera.com, or private message us on our Facebook page. Those are the two best ways to get a hold of us. Uh, we do have a lot of shared videos going around. We do appreciate uh, those who do share the video, but you might comment on that, and we might not see it. And so email us, questions at answeringreligiousera.com dot com or private message us on our Facebook page. Again, this is our live Bible Q&A. We also have a Monday through Friday uh, show. It's a podcast only, and you can find that on all major podcast platforms. It is called The Daily Answer with Mark Dunnigan. That drops every Monday through Friday at 5 a.m. Eastern time. So we encourage you to check that out. Let Mark challenge you as uh, you get ready for the day, as you are on the way to work, or whatever it may be. And it's about 15, 20 minutes. So it's just a great way to start the day. That is the Daily Answer podcast with Mark Dunnigan. All right, gentlemen, uh, it's good to see every one of you today. We've got a, a couple of uh, extras on. Uh, Nick is filling in, uh, which he's becoming a regular fill-in, it seems. Um, and then we have Bob McPherson at the very bottom underneath him, and he is from Kentucky. And then we've got our usual guys, Bob and Brian. Good to see every one of you. Bob McPherson, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, where you preach uh, and work, because there may be some audience members out there who are interested in uh, in, in your location, especially if those of you out there who are wanting to meet with us and, and study. Uh, we do offer that. Uh, if you're if you're wanting to study the, the Word of God and uh, and have knowledge about Christ, we would love to sit down and study with you. So we we live in various places. I live in uh, Texarkana, Texas. Uh, Bob is in Macon, Georgia. 
Uh, Brian is in the Portland area, uh, Oregon uh, area, or yeah, Oregon area. And then uh, Nick is in the uh, Morgantown, Kentucky area. And then uh, Terry is in, uh, he just moved. And so my mind just went blank. Bo uh, help me out. Russell. Russell. Russellville, Alabama. And then, so where are you from, Bob? Tell them about your church. Hey, Brian. So I uh, live in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, and work with the East Side Church of Christ here in Bowling Green. It's only, uh, as we say in Kentucky, one county over and about 30 uh, minutes from where Nick's working in Morgantown. Yeah, good deal. All right. Well, I appreciate you feeling in today and uh, looking forward to the show. Uh, let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Bob, you mind leading us to that? McPherson? Okay. Fathers, we bow before you at this time. We're thankful for the blessings that you give us in this life. We're thankful even now for the opportunity we have to spend some time uh, together studying your word and talking about things that are of spiritual and eternal import to us. Be with us. Help us to uh, determine those things that you have revealed and use those to guide our thinking and help us to be a, a aid to others in doing the same. We uh, love you and we're especially thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace that you've shown us in and through your son and your plan to redeem us to you through him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. 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 Appreciate the, the prayer there. All right. This is our live Bible Q&A. Email us questions at answeringreligiousair.com or private message us on our Facebook page. We do have a lineup, but uh, if you'll send in your question now, we'll strive to get it uh, today on today's live uh, show. But first, it is meme time. All right, this meme is going around on social media, and we wanted to deal with it today. Um, it's got a, a girl with a megaphone who is shouting out, Jesus is my homeboy. And uh, I don't know. I, I've got a lot of uh, feelings on this. I'm sure the panel does as well, um, uh, treating Jesus like that. And so I, I want us to break down this meme uh, because there are a lot of people who are uh, who are sharing similar things as this. So. Let's uh, let's start with you, Brian Haynes, and uh, tell me what you what you think about this meme. You know, if someone came up to me and just kind of said that in a passing comment, I probably wouldn't say anything um, because I, I know what they're trying to express. They're trying to say that they uh, have a connection with Jesus. Um, and of course, you know, we want everybody to have a connection with Jesus. But that being said, um, a lot of times there's a tendency in people to try to rather than elevate ourselves to you know, to pursue the things of God is to bring God down to a level where he's like us. Uh, you know, it used to be you talk about God as the man upstairs uh, when, of course, God says, hey, I'm not a man. And uh, that's a pretty distinct uh, language characteristic about God. We have to be careful when we make statements like this, because what we could be doing is we could be denigrating or reflecting an attitude of denigration towards God. Uh, Jesus is our savior. He's our mediator. He, he's the person who died for us. He's God in the flesh. And while he offers us a relationship that is, you know, Jesus would say to the apostles, you're my friends. If you, you know, uh, love me like I love you, you know, in the book of John chapter 12, it, it's also true that we're supposed to have a, a, rev, a reverence and respect for him. Does the mean person in this case have that respect I'm not sure. You know, it doesn't really come out in that sense. And certainly I think that it's not something I would want to say. So there's, those are my thoughts on it. Thank you, Terry. Go ahead. I agree. I agree with that. We just, we need to rever God, not try to reduce him to our level. He came in the flesh and in that sense, he is like us and we can relate to him because he came in the flesh, but he is so much more than that. And the, the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter one come to mind. He is described this way in Ephesians 1 21. He's far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. You can't get any higher than that. And if you rever and respect people in, that are in principalities and powers, governing authorities and that kind of thing, and you don't approach them uh, with that, uh, that manner, then certainly we would not want to approach Jesus in that way. And then in Philippians chapter two, starting verse nine, he says, God has highly, highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow 
bowing to the knee of and bowing the knee to Jesus. That name is above every name. He's special, he's unique, and he's to be exalted and revered. Uh, people cast down their crowns when they are in the presence of Jesus, represented in Revelation 4 and 5. So gee, I, I just don't see bringing Jesus down to this kind of level. I don't think that shows the reverence that you need. Amen to those comments there. Nick, what you got? Yeah, so one of the problems, though, that we can run into when we uh, talk about the reverence of Christ yeah, we, we do need to revere him. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We uh, we bow down to him as the one who rules and has sovereignty over our lives. Uh, but, you know, the Catholics took it way too far where he was so aloof and so frightening that they have now turned to Mary to petition uh, for that warmth and that comfort, uh, that mediator uh, between God and man. And, and that's certainly taken it way too far. Jesus uh, says himself in John 15, uh, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So there is a warmth, uh, you know, because we revere him doesn't mean that we hold him so far aloof where we have no warmth with him. And, and so there is a balance there. Uh, take saying Jesus is my homeboy is taking it too far, but then uh, doing as the Catholics do is. Uh, taking it way too far, the other swing of that pendulum. And so I would just uh, throw out that caution as we're talking about this subject. All right, Bob, you got any comments? Well, yeah, the only other aspect of uh, that language that uh, struck me besides the, the lack of reverence we've talked about yet is this the this such common language that's a term in slang is used for a peer. And, and it's, it, that kind of language sometimes can uh, reveal a notion that my relationship to Jesus is on my terms that relax things. I think it's another thing to, to, to think about that sometimes that language guards that notion that, hey, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going was the way it was said in the 70s, I think. But that that type of a overly personal, overly familiar on my terms thinking. All right. Appreciate it, guys. I appreciate those comments. And uh, if you need more clarification on the meme, then uh, as uh, as always, you can email us questions at answeringreligiousair.com or send in your memes as well. If you see any floating around on Facebook, we appreciate it. You send it in. Let us uh, answer those things. All right. Our first question uh, for the day today is how much should I give in my contribution? Also, if I'm only paid two times a month, do I have to give every week? Uh, I will say from the from the very beginning, uh, the lineup we have today is really uh, back to the basic questions. I mean, there's a bunch of those kind of questions. So we're going to have a, a, a bunch of those today. So I appreciate those questions. But and I'm, I'm curious about this question, too, guys. I'd like to see what you have to say about it, especially about the being paid two times a month. You know, as preachers, at least for me, I'm paid once a month. And, you know, Paul says in First Corinthians, chapter 16, you know, to give as you have been prosper. Well, I prosper, quote unquote, once a month. You know, can I, so can I give once a month or do I have to break that once a month paycheck into four Sundays or five Sundays, whatever the month holds? So I, I do appreciate this question. So, uh, uh, Terry, let's start with you. Well, first Corinthians, excuse me, first Corinthians chapter 16, one and two talks about giving every first day of the week. And, uh, that was for the, the common good that they had in mind. And, and so it didn't matter. Uh, how often you had an income, you you had something that you could give on the first day of the week. So I've always looked at it from the standpoint, of I get paid once a month, but I'm prospering that whole month from that paycheck. So I, I break it down. Uh, I'm not saying that there's a hard, fast rule for that, but I'm just, uh, but just for conscience sake and just to make sure I'm, I'm giving on the first day of every week. I, I do it that way. So you can do it that way. So it's not a, it's not an imposition to do it that way. And it fulfills uh, the command to give every first day of the week. All right. Appreciate it. That's uh covers it. Well, any, any other comments on that guys? All right. Our next question that we have here uh, is grape juice. The only kind of fruit of the vine we are to take during the Lord's supper. Uh, that's a good question, um, especially you've got some who are advocating maybe wine, um, advocating. Uh, I don't know anyone that advocates soda. Do you? But <laughs> uh, who, who wants this one? Uh, right, so 
So all my life, I've always heard, hey, fruit of the vine, grapes or tomatoes or gourds grow on vine. So any of those would be acceptable. And for a long time, I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds like good reasoning. Um, someone challenged me to that a couple of years ago. And so I did a little bit of studying. Um, the term fruit of the vine is actually pretty specific. It, it doesn't mean any fruit on the vine. It's kind of like we would use the word vineyard. Um, if I say, hey, I'm driving through a bunch of vineyards, you you know I don't mean tomatoes. You know you know I'm not going through a gourd uh, farm or anything like that. It, the term is specific to the idea of grapes. Fruit of the vine is actually a term that's specific to grapes. Now, uh, the second question is, well, does, you know, wine is also uh, a fruit of the vine. Where does that fit in? And I remember years ago, I uh, uh, observed a Jehovah's Witness uh, communion ceremony. They only do it once a year on the on what they believe is the Passover. And uh, they were talking in it and they pulled out a bottle of wine and they said the scriptures are specific that wine was what Jesus used. And of course, uh, any of us that know the scriptures know Jesus actually specifically does not use the word wine. He, he is very specific to avoid that word, even though well, the word wine is all through the New Testament. Jesus is specific not to use that term, but instead uses this expression, the fruit of the vine. And that's the uh, <clears throat> term. And I, I went to them later about that and they were kind of shocked that they hadn't really read the scriptures. But the point is this, why not wine? It's kind of interesting, but during the Passover ceremony, uh, we have some historical evidence that suggests that it was considered taboo to use wine. And the reasoning is because of the fermentation process involved in wine, uh, that fermentation was likened to leavening and that it was something that had to be purged out of the home during the Passover period. So, uh, in fact, Jesus would not have been using something fermented for the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, it gives us a good sense of what we're talking about here. When the Bible talks about the fruit of the vine, it's almost certainly talking about very, very much what we're using in our in our ceremony today. All right, Bob, what you got? Well, uh, I had a reason to kind of do an evolution of thought very similar to what Brian began with there. And I just want to bring up one thing that came out of that uh, study I did on that to kind of reinforce the idea. So if you look at Matthew 26 or Mark 14, and the word there that we translate via that phrase, fruit of the vine, is the same exact word that's in James 3, 12. And you see the specific nature of that word used in comparison there. James 3, 12, uh, can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine bear or produce figs? So that same word is, is specificity of a grape to a fig is the problem there. So you just see that that word is used as narrowly as Brian mentioned there to reference a grapevine. Hey, appreciate those comments there, guys. All right. Uh, next question that we have is a live one uh, from Katie here. Hello. When confronted with the issue of kitchens and fellowship halls in the church, how do you answer when someone comes back with a rebuttal of book, chapter and verse to show where it is wrong? Uh, we understand that you need authorization or example, but how do we really bring that home? Um, let's start with you, uh, Brian Haynes. Uh, you bet, Katie. Thanks for the question. And uh, uh, by the way, Katie, you're you're uh, you're in our prayers a lot for a lot of things that are going on right now. Uh, so first of all, what we like to make a point is to say that the idea of uh, the authority for these things it's not so much a the Bible speaks against it, but that it, the question becomes is one is it authorized? Is it an appropriate work? An important idea is the idea, say for example, of a fellowship hall. Uh, somebody, of course, might say, well, fellowship is an authorized work, but we would go to 1 John. That might be a passage I would stop in, and I would say 1 John chapter 1 defines fellowship. And it has nothing to do with eating meals. It has to do with our relationship with one another as long as we're abiding in the doctrine of Christ. And so the very first thing I might say is that the very term fellowship hall is a misnomer, that there's no con uh, connection of fellowship with eating in scriptures. Instead, fellowship is purely our relationship with one another. I might go to a passage like that, uh, might jump to a passage like not to add to or take away from when we talk about these things as well. Uh, to that end, what is the purpose there? What people are trying to do is they're trying to create a new church work, uh, a new church work of socializing, as though that's one of the purposes of the church. And very simply put, I'd reverse the question. I'd say book, chapter, and verse on the church's work of socializing, the church's work of creating an opportunity. And then I might say, on top of that, you know, you jump to a passage like Hebrews chapter 13, where, where he talks about the idea of 
of showing hospitality to one another. Um, and, and variety of passages, actually, that command us to show hospitality to one another. And then I can say very specifically, hospitality, which is probably the, the best I could say to a social commandment, is not a commandment given to the church, but to the individual. If I let the church do it, uh, I am taking away the opportunity for the individual to do something that they are obligated to do. Uh, elders can't be elders unless they show hospitality. Uh, there's there's a lot to be said about these circumstances uh, that I am trying to force the church to do something that God very specifically wants us as Christians not only to do, but to be observed to do it. So I'm creating a pretty big problem there as well. Um, that's kind of a start on that. I, I know the other guys have something to say, and I'd like to hear what they have to say too. But again, Katie, really appreciate your thoughts. Hey, good, good thoughts there. Uh, Terry, go ahead. Well, I would, I would point to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, and he says he's rebuking the brethren at Corinth because they were making a, a, a common meal the focus of their being together. And he says, when you come together, that's so 1120, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Lord's Supper is authorized as a part of our fellowship because it is itself an expression of fellowship. But the Lord's Supper is communing with the Lord. It's communing via the remembrance of his body and of his blood. So that's the meal. That's the supper that the Lord authorizes for the church. But then he says, now you're not doing it to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, one takes his own supper ahead of others. So you're you're actually just eating your own supper. And so that's not the Lord's Supper at all. And one is hungry and another is drunk. What do you not have houses to eat and drink in? So he takes that out of the church action and says, that's for the home. That's for you to do at home. You can do that at home, but don't do that uh, here because that's your own. That's not the Lord's. So there is a place for eating common meals, but it's not in the assembly and it's not part of the work of the church. And so that, that distinction needs to be clearly put in mind. If it is a work of the church, then the church must make provisions for it. Uh, the church must build uh, facilities that help do what this work is. Uh, and, and you don't have that authority. It's, it's like playing games. Uh, yes, in the home you can play games, but that's not the work of the church. So you wouldn't build a facility for playing games as a work of the church. Now, you could do that in your home, and you can have people over to play games, but you recognize the fact that some things are the work of the church because God told the church what to do. And if he didn't tell the church to do it, it wasn't in God's plan that the church do that. So the proof really falls on the shoulders of those who want to saddle the church with such a work, either games or providing uh, social meals. Those things fall to the family unit, to the home, and not to the church. You don't find the authority. So the, proof, the person that's got to prove their position is the one that imposes something on the church that you don't find in the scriptures. You have to find it there, not to invent it. And those are my thoughts. Hey, appreciate uh, those comments there. Katie, if you need any more clarification, email us questions at answeringreligiousair.com. If you have any specific arguments you'd like for us to deal with, you know, as well, we'd love to help you out with that. Appreciate you in those comments there. All right. Our next live question. Oh, quick, quickly, we have a uh, follow up uh, to the grape juice uh, question that I've just totally forgot what the question was. Give me a second here. Uh, is grape juice the only kind of fruit of the vine are we to take uh, that we are to take during the Lord's supper. So this was a follow-up to that question. Is, is it okay for sweetened or should it be unsweetened? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Brian? Oh, that's tough. Why'd you throw that at me? Um, that's not, well, you're the one that answered answer. the question to begin with. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's not easy. You know, I'll tell you a story. When I was a boy, uh, there was a, there was a gal at church who 
wanted the grape juice to be authentic. So she, uh, she'd squeeze it by hand. Uh, she'd make it, um, by every third week it was vinegar. And, mm. um, you know, you could just tell when people, especially people that were visitors were taking it. You just see them kind of shake when they took it uh, because it would hit them really hard. Uh, Jerry, it's it's a tough question uh, because, you know, we want to say, well, pure and undiluted, you know, you would think is the best. But that's actually not always a great thing. You know, there's an interesting story in Mr. Welch, who is the uh, founder of Welch's Grape Juice. You know, Welch's Grape Juice was actually made for communion. That's uh he he was a Methodist, I think he was Methodist, and he didn't like the idea of them using uh wine. He wanted he wanted something that he saw as a little more accurate to the Lord's Supper. So he came up with a pasteurization process for grape juice, and that's why we can put grape juice on the shelves now and uh have it sit for a long time. Ironically, his congregation never adopted it. Uh they they always stuck with what they had, even though we all use his today. I would say it's probably a matter of one's conscience. In other words, um, I'm not sure to suggest that, you know, any chemical process would dilute what they have. Um, I would just, uh, I would just say that I don't know that I have enough, uh, certainty to, to go one way or the other. I would love for it to be pure and exactly what it was, but I recognize that that may not be always available. And most likely they were, uh, as you know, there's, you know, there's some preachers who've done some fantastic work on how they might have brought, you know, the Lord's Supper in different places, or brought fruit of the vine in different places, especially places where, you know, grapes wouldn't be available. And of course, some of that might be the idea of mixing in a syrupy uh, ingredient into water and things like that. And I think the whole point is if they're adding water to it, if they're adding other chemicals to it, sugar probably isn't uh, problematic. Uh, but at the same time, I could see where that could be a matter of conscience. So I think I'd put it there. I'm really interested to hear the other guys uh, actually give a better answer for this. Well, see, I'm the host, so I don't have to deal with these hard questions. You know, so Terry, you got anything you want to add to that or you satisfied with his answer? Well, I think we ought to try to uh, make it as pure as possible. Uh, sometimes it develops its own sweetness. It's naturally sweet, and I, I would go with the natural as uh, to the best of my ability. But um, I don't know. I've never seen sweetened and unsweetened on the shelf, so I've just I've just gone with the grape juice and asked no questions for conscience' sake. Uh, Nick, what you got? Uh, so Brian brought up an interesting point about preservation, talking about pasteurization. Uh, that's usually one of the biggest arguments that's thrown out there for the use of wine on the communion table because that is the ancient way that they preserved their their juice that's the argument but what we have discovered through archaeological finds is that is far from the truth josephus even mentions how when the romans finally captured uh, masada that there were uh, fruits and and juices that were preserved up in that uh, stronghold that Herod the Great had placed 100 years prior, and it was still just as fresh as the day it was picked. And so we have lost the art of preservation that the ancients had. And there are many different ways to, to preserve the juice. Uh, you can uh, boil the water out of it, get it more of a syrup. Uh, you can seal it up in cast and drop it into uh, the river. Uh, there, there's just many different ways, and, and uh, pasteurization is the predominant way we use today, but it is not the only way to preserve the juice, and the ancients had those uh, techniques figured out. All right, appreciate those comments there. Uh, Jerry, hopefully hopefully that, that helps clear that up for you. All right, our next question here, uh, is the sinner's prayer biblical? The sinner's prayer biblical. Uh, let's define what the sinner's prayer is, at least from my definition of what I know of the sinner's prayer is you might find that in a track somewhere laying around at a restaurant or unfortunately in a bathroom at the urinal. Uh, there's a track on there that says, Hey, do you want to go to heaven? Do you want eternal life? And just say this prayer. And generally speaking, the prayer is to accept Jesus into your heart, to ask for forgiveness. And then from there on the track will say, go and find a church of your choice. Uh, but the question here asked is, is the sinner's prayer that that idea of asking Jesus in your heart, asking for forgiveness, is that biblical? I'd say there is no specific uh, example of a sinner's prayer listed in the Bible. So, man, if, it, if you engage in prayer before you're in Christ, uh, in, in an effort to move you closer to understanding. I'd say you, you can find people praying 
before they were saved, like Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, his prayers came up for a memorial before God. But like you were saying, Brian, there is a specific prayer that people say, this is the sinner's prayer. And that's not in the Bible anywhere. You, you have to make that up. Now, your heart needs to be inclined to seek God and seeking God you, in desperation. You grope for him. You call for him. But um, finding him actually is in the process of listening to what he says. So on the day of Pentecost, you have the prophecy of Joel saying uh, that the spirit would be poured out and and uh, there would be prophecies and that kind of thing. And, and the end result would be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord would be saved. But then he goes on to, to explain, well, how do you call on the name of the Lord? Because after saying that, 3,000 people were asking, what shall we do? So they apparently didn't know what's involved in calling on the name of the Lord. And Peter didn't answer that in Acts 2.37. Um, he didn't answer the question, what should we do, by explaining, well, just say the sinner's prayer. There was no such thing as that. And so what he told them was to repent, which means a turning around of the mind and the heart and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, for the remission of sins. Now, if you lock that in your mind that repent and be baptized for, in the name of Jesus Christ is the process of calling on the name of the Lord because you're appealing to him by his authority to give us remission of sins. But you're doing that in your repentance and in your being buried with him in baptism. So you're calling on, on him in that. So that's how you approach God for salvation. It's not there's some magical formula of a prayer listed in the Bible somewhere that's called the sinner's prayer. That's not in the Bible. Now, Acts 22, 16 says, arise. What are you waiting for, uh, Saul? <laughs> arise and be baptized. Now, he'd been praying for three days. He'd lost his sight, been praying for three days. But uh, Ananias told him to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So he relates that to the act that's involved in baptism, just as Peter did on the day of Pentecost. And he told us specifically then, how, how does a sinner come into Christ? And he repents because he believes in Jesus. He calls on his name in baptism and he's given remission of sins. His sins are washed away. So is the sinner's prayer biblical? Short answer, no, it's not. There is a way to approach God with an earnest seeking of him that the Bible does describe, but it doesn't describe the sinner's prayer. I appreciate that. Nick, what you got? Yeah, just to follow up on uh, what Terry said, he did a fantastic job, uh, but I Going back to Cornelius there in Acts chapter 10, that, that is a very unique opportunity to see a sinner's prayer in action. Uh, if the sinner's prayer as defined today was what was used, then that would have been the opportune time to see it done. But right. what what is the uh, prayer that we see there? We see that Cornelius in verse uh, 30 uh, was talking to Peter. He says, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house at Simon, a tanner by the sea. And when he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. So several things you can unpack from just this one text. Uh, the sinner's prayer uh, did not save him, though it was a uh, it led to his salvation because it shows his genuine, sincere heart. And, and God, you know, sent him a sign saying, go get Simon. And if 
so there was some supernatural salvation could have taken place, such as, oh, I heard uh, God speak to me, or I saw an angel, and therefore I'm saved. You know, that also is debunked with this, because he still had to hear the message of the gospel from Peter. And so that is the mechanism through which uh, people's faith is grown, is through the hearing of the word of God. And Peter did come to Cornelius' house, and he did preach the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to Cornelius in his household. And at the very end, Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. And so everything that Terry said, you see it taking place there in the example of Cornelius. Yeah. Amen to that. Uh, Bob, what you got? Well, I, you couldn't do a better job in answering what is meant by calling on the name of the Lord, as Terry did and uh, Nick expounded upon. But I found it effective sometimes at the beginning of that conversation when we get to Acts 2 to say, let's talk about what we know, what we can know that doesn't mean. And then simply go back to Matthew 7 and verse 21, where Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I find it sometimes if we... Because that's the, the surface level uh, assumption that all that is meant by that language is something as simple as that. And I think sometimes uh, addressing that and then talking about walking through like we have with Acts 2 and Acts 10 is, is an effective way to answer that. Hey, appreciate those comments there, guys. All right. I uh, hope that helped uh, the questioner there. Next question that we have for today. Uh, now, this question we did not receive, but I saw it on Facebook from two different people put it on Facebook. And so I was like, you know what? Two different people are asking. We're going to answer it. Uh, are only members of the church of Christ going to heaven? In fact, I was uh, talking to someone this week and somebody made mention about that. So that's three times I've heard this question this week. So I do want to, I do want us to answer it, but I also, uh, I have not made mention uh, today. If you'd like to come on the show, you know, we are taking your questions. You can, you can email us questions at answering religious or private message us on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash answering religious air. But maybe you want to come on the show. Uh, you're brave enough to show your face, ask your question live on air. We'd love to have you on and you can come on, ask a question, maybe go back and forth with us a little bit and uh, ask us for clarification on things, whatever it may be. We'd love to have you come on the show and ask your Bible question. So if you'll look at the uh, description on Facebook, then you should be able to see uh, a link there for that. And uh, if not, uh, then uh, private message us and we'll get that link to you. But there should be a link on the description there and you can follow those instructions and you can come on the show. All right. The question is, are only members of the Church of Christ going to heaven? Uh, Nick, let's start with you. You know, I had to deal with this uh, question back in college. I was studying with uh, a friend of mine. I think he and I both were in the aviation program together. And and we were sitting there talking. We would get together and just talk about the Bible all the time. And he brought this question up and he said, uh, he said, uh, so you guys think you're the only ones going to heaven. And so what I did was I said, well, uh, we, let's qualify what the Church of Christ is. And so I took him through the process saying, you know, looking at uh, Acts chapter two, Acts chapter 20, excuse me, verse 28, where it says that uh, the blood of God was shed for the church. And so which church is that? Well, it's the one that Jesus Christ uh, built back in uh, Matthew uh, chapter is it chapter 18 verse 16 or 16 verse 18 i get those 16, mixed up 16 18. 16 18 uh it's the one that he built and so which one did he die for he died for his church and so the church that belongs to him is the church that's going to be saved now there is some caveats to that there are going to be some churches that claim to be the church of christ uh but even though they have a name that says they are alive they are dead churches that's revelation chapter 3 and so what determines what is a church of Christ? Well, it's the church that surrenders and submits to the judgments, doctrines, precepts of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's how I answered it for him. And he understood it at that point. And knowing that Jesus is the head of the church and we are the body and, and uh, there are going to be localized uh, bodies uh, in different locations. And, and so that's how I answered it. He understood it. Uh, whether he wanted to agree with it or not, I think that might have been a different story. Uh, Terry, appreciate that, uh, yeah, Nick. Yeah, Ephesians 5, 23 says Jesus is the Savior of the body, which he's already identified in Ephesians as the church. So all the saved are in Jesus' church. There's not another church. He doesn't have one church over here. That's the saved. And then here's a different church, and that's also the saved. 
Now he has one, one body, Ephesians 4, verse 4. So all of the saved are in that one body. That's his church. Uh, so and we're not saying, and I don't know of anybody that would say, uh, the Bell Green Church that I attend, that's the only church that's going to be saved. Now that's a local church. Hopefully we're trying to make sure everybody in that local church is first and primarily in the one body. But everybody in a local church isn't necessarily saved. They may not be doing the will of God. As was mentioned, ago, mentioned a while ago, you're, you may have a name that's uh, alive, but you're actually dead. God judges that. But you do have to be added to that one body, the church that belongs to Christ. And there's not but one. And it's his. And uh, we should not be ashamed to identify. That's the church of Christ that we're talking about. All the saved are in that one body. And you're not saved if you're not in that one body, because getting in the body is the part is the process of being saved. So uh, it's a matter of defining what do you mean by that term? If, if you imagine that uh, that a denomination that just calls itself the Church of Christ, that that that's you know, your concept of that that uh, group is correct. You may be incorrect about what you think about certain people. But there is only one church, and that one church has all the saved. And you can't get around that. And we can't deny then that only members of the church of Christ are going to heaven. Just make sure you're in that one church that belongs to him. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate those comments. Um, that, was, that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, next question that we have here. Give me a second here. Uh, do we have the responsibility as members of a local congregation to attend every time the doors are open? Uh, yeah, we hear that a lot. So uh, do we have that responsibility? Uh, Bob, let's start with you. Bob McPherson. The other, the other Bob dropped off because of the Internet. So you're the only Bob on today's show. Yeah, I, um, I, I you know, a lot of it, I think. The idea of responsibility, uh, that's an English word that hits people differently. Uh, I like to have this conversation uh, from the from the aspect of, of what, what, are you, what are you thinking about? In, in other words, sometimes this comes as a minimum requirements question. And, and that moves into a better conversation, I think, for those of us who are trying to seek the kingdom and, and be disciples. Are we really talking about what's the minimum I have to do? And so that's kind of maybe the direction I go off in this conversation sometimes. But I'll just say one thing about that. In the past, when I have had this conversation, uh, sometimes it's been about someone who is only and ever or only and ever recollects hearing Hebrews 10, 25 quoted in a vacuum. And it's just it's been impactful in my experience talking to people is to take them to Hebrews chapter 10, but start up in verse 22 and, and talk about where that idea of coming together uh, fits in there and the importance of what we're accomplishing as we do that, that is more than just me worrying about me meeting my minimum requirements. Uh, so if you go back to, to verse 22 and, and, and talk about uh, the, the heart that's being described here uh, in response to uh, understanding what Christ has done for us, this new better covenant, and then the encouragement begins there in verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And in verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So I, I think sometimes we talk about this subject in isolation and, and I try to make the point that what we really ought to be thinking about is our desire to draw near, our desire to hold fast and what should be our desire and our responsibility to consider and stimulate or encourage one another to love and good works. And then that's where verse 25 comes in. How do you, how, do, how does the inspired writer say one way you go about doing that or what, what's consistent with doing that is not forsaking our own assembling together. So, uh, and that's not everything could be said about that, but, uh, for lack of a better term, I, I like to take a question like that and try to elevate the conversation. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, Brian Haynes. That was really great, Bob. Um, and the thing I, I, I grab at a comment like this is that there's a really dangerous uh, thinking behind it. And that is, what is the minimum I can do to get by? That's a lot of times what people are really asking about. And that that's a tremendously dangerous 
way of thinking. I like to think of the, you know, attending the Lord's uh, uh, assembly, the times we come together, like going to the gym. And somebody says, hey, I, I want to get healthy. I want to lose weight. I want to be more fit. What's the minimal amount I can do uh, that? Can I go to the gym once a week? And I like to make the point to say, if you go to the gym once a week, it's going to hurt every time you go. It's going to be really miserable because you're going to have to undo all the things you've been doing all week. Uh, the, the best use of the gym is to go just as often as you can in order to build up and to remain fit like that. And anybody who's trying to approach their time to, with other saints, which is vitally important. Um, but like I said, it's like the gym. It's not as though I miss one day and I'm completely lost. But at the same time, when I'm in, and I like the Hebrews 10 uh, analogy of, you know, the habit of forsaking the assembly. When I'm, when I'm in the habit of saying, what's the minimum I can do? Not only am I not going to get spiritually fit, but it's going to be unpleasant for me. You know, when people talk about not enjoying the assembly of the saints, it's almost always because like going to the gym once a week, you're doing it so seldom that you're actually working against these other things that are building up in your body. So there's a real there's a real danger to have a mindset that's trying to say, what's the least I can do? Or, you know, the uh, how can I get out of this? Uh, there should be a mindset that understands this is my opportunity to change and to improve and and the question ought to be things like, um, you know, it, it, uh, what would stop me from doing that? What kind of things are worth stopping me for getting that done? And it, it really is an important thing. It's something I like to hammer down and harp on a lot because I think that this is one of those things that people, people that are consistent uh, about joining every assembly they can, these are the people that make it. These are the people that endure to the end. And the people that are all about, well, you know, what's what's the minimum I got to do? These are always the people that don't make it. My uh, in my observations here. Yeah, good good comments there, Terry. Well, I'd, I'd bring in and along that line that uh, that Brian was just mentioning and that Bob mentioned about uh, doing good. I mean, uh, meeting together to build up love and good works. That's a good thing. Well, Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 seems to me to be an important verse that comes into play. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to those of the household of faith. So we've got an special responsibility to our brethren and doing good to them, especially well, assembling is one of those especially good things to do because that's the way you build up love and good works. You got the opportunity, then do it. Don't look for an excuse not to do it. Look for every opportunity that you can. So if you if you got the opportunity to go and you choose not to go, you're choosing not to build up the church. You're choosing not to do good works. And I think you're going to be held accountable for that. We're all going to be held accountable for missing and not using opportunities that we have to do good. If you got the opportunity, do it. Do good with that opportunity. Amen to that. Appreciate those uh, that wisdom there, guys. Next question, maybe our final question for the day. Someone joked about attributing Paul to the book of Hebrews. Where does the line cross from misunderstanding? Uh, that is, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews to false teaching, like saying Jesus didn't raise from the dead. Uh, but is saying Paul wrote Hebrews false teaching? It's a good question. Uh, Terry, you're shaking your head, so uh, I'm going to call on you. What you got? Well, two different things. The Whether we know the author of the book of Hebrews or not, uh, it could be that Paul wrote it, and I, I, I tend to believe that he did, but I could be wrong about that, and, and it doesn't affect my faith what, uh, in, in any way. Now, it is very clear about Jesus was raised from the dead. That's very clear. In fact, that's the whole point of every one of the gospel accounts, and it's stated all through the epistles. So if you miss that, that's a stated point. Jesus was raised from the dead. You don't have to have a stated point about who wrote the book of Hebrews because it's not stated. Uh, and, and so uh, I can believe that it was the Apostle Paul and it's not going to lead me to in any false teaching or even a false concept. Uh, and so I can believe that. 
because it's not, and I may believe there's a good reason for Paul not to write or sign his name. He signed his name to everything else, but for some reason he didn't sign it to this one. Well, is that, does that really matter? Because I could think of his last episode of being in Jerusalem among the Jews and that didn't end up very well. And he went to prison. He went to prison at Caesarea and then went to prison at Rome. And so it could be a good reason not, well, my influence is, it was pretty bad last time I was there. Maybe, maybe I'll just send a, a letter and not put my name to it because I want them to know about uh, the superiority of Christ in the New Testament rather than being, uh, being prejudiced by my name being signed to it. So, you know, there's all kinds of theories that you can come up with that would explain why the, the letter wasn't signed, but it doesn't say anything about whether it is true and whether it's inspired. And that's where we can get into trouble, that that letter is the inspired word of God. And that we do have to believe. Those are my thoughts. Brian, what you got? Oh, one thing to think about here, and I was actually kind of thinking more about the question of, uh, you know, the, if, uh, and maybe I even misunderstood a little bit about the idea of joking about, you know, certain things in the scripture. And uh, I, I certainly don't think that there's really a problem that we kind of see something as humorous. Sometimes I think it's funny that you, you think about uh, Paul's or Peter saying that Paul wrote some things hard to understand. And I'm thinking, well, have you read first Peter and some of the things in the middle of that uh, you have to wonder about what, what's going on there. Um, and so I don't think, you know, I think that uh, a sense of humor is definitely a uh, something that we we perhaps even received from God. Um, I have to uh, think that way. Uh, as far as the idea, though, is when is somebody just guessing at something and, you know, when are they teaching false doctrine? I do think Terry hit it on the head to say sometimes there are things that we don't have a specific answer to and we're just trying to fill in a gap. We're just trying to kind of bridge a thought so that we can move from one to the next. Uh, it's a reasonable question to say, who wrote Hebrews? And somebody to say, yeah, you know, uh, Paul wrote Hebrews. You know, they said it kind of confidently. Um, that's not unreasonable. Um, it's unreasonable, though, if we take something that we know to be true, that we have to establish to be true, and to deny that, that's when it becomes unreasonable. There are uh, types of information that we're just not filled in on. And in those moments, you know, to speculate, um, I don't think that is problematic. Um, in fact, like I said, we might see lots of times in scriptures where people speculated on what kinds of things might be fulfilled certain ways about prophecies and things like that. And they even acted on those speculations sometimes trying to find the fulfillment of those things. And I, and I think that that would be an appropriate uh, thing to do, such as the authorship of Hebrews. There's nothing inappropriate about speculating about that. I, in fact, in fact, maybe I might even add this to say that the only problem I might have is whenever somebody became dogmatic to a degree that they did call somebody else a false teacher about it, uh, whenever it's purely a speculative moment. Then in other words, somebody said, hey, if you don't believe Paul is the author of Hebrews, you're in error, that might be more problematic. Um, but conversely, though, it's important for us to understand that some things are clearly revealed. The, the raising of Jesus from the dead, Jesus being God in the flesh, um, uh, characteristics like that, that uh, Jesus is the foundation of, and head of the church, uh, all sorts of different things like that that are challenged all the time. Uh, those are things that we have a certainty about that are repeated and clearly stated that we have to accept as truth. Appreciate those comments. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I would just say, and I really appreciate the way both Terry and Brian made this uh, and I would just say this point is one I, I use with the younger people here in Bowling Green a lot, maybe particularly in the realm of evidences and apologetics, is sometimes when people come to us for answers, it, it is OK for us to help them with their question, because the question may not be one that can be answered because it's it's flawed. And, and when we talk about such a gulf between uh, speculating on unrevealed things and denying or rejecting revealed truths, that's not a good comparison. That, so I think you have to help them with their question the way both these gentlemen sort of between those two. And, and I think that's uh, particularly important for us because we don't owe it to somebody to accept their premise of a question or their assumptions in a question. We can help them see that the question itself uh, needs a little work and drive thought a little deeper. All right, guys. Uh, Nick, you got anything or are we done? I think it's been said quite well, so I'll right. stay back. 
All right, then uh, that's uh, the show for today. We do appreciate all the questions that we have uh, received today and uh, appreciate to those who have tuned in uh, for the live and those who are going to listen on the replay as well as the podcast. We appreciate you as well. Any last minute comment, guys, before we close out? Great great questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were back to the basic questions. Uh, Bob, appreciate you filling in today. And uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'd love to have you again sometime. Long time listener, first time caller. Yeah, I hear you. You're not the first to say that. That was actually Nick who said that. Uh, we had, when we first started the uh, ability to come on the show, well, he he calls into the show and, and he said that. And I mean, I just lost it. I mean, it was hilarious. But anyway, um, appreciate you being on, Bob, and, and you, Nick, for, for filling in, even though you are becoming a regular guy, so it seems. All right, that's our show for today. We do appreciate those who are tuning in. We do want to have quick, give a quick lineup for the rest of the week. Uh, We do have on Thursday, which is tomorrow, it's a show for women by women called Older Women Likewise. And so if you are a sister in Christ and you need encouragement, you need to be challenged from the scriptures, we encourage you to check out them on Facebook as well as on YouTube and on podcasts. It is Older Women Likewise every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. But going back to Monday, we have Bob's Bible Basics. He was on for a few minutes, then his Internet crashed on him and uh, he goes live on Facebook, YouTube every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern time where he does deal with the basics of the Bible. So if you're just starting off, maybe you're trying to learn the scriptures, you want to know what the basics are, what the foundations are, I would encourage you to check him out every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Then on Tuesdays, back to Answering Religious Air, we are doing a series on the study of Ecclesiastes. We did chapter 6 last night, and uh, next or next uh, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time will be chapter 7. If you have missed that series, we'd encourage you to check out the archived videos on YouTube and Facebook. We also go live on Twitter and the show will be uploaded to the podcast. And so if if you're not able to catch us live in audio only, then you can find us on all major podcast platforms. Same thing with our Wednesday show, our live Bible Q&A every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So if we didn't get to your question, we will uh, get to it next week, Lord willing. But you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and on podcast. And so we'd appreciate you uh, tuning in and checking out those places. Also, last but not least, is our Monday through Friday uh, 5 a.m. show, which is the Daily Answer podcast with Mark Dunnigan. He wasn't able to make it today, but do appreciate all the work he puts into the Daily Answer. It's about a 15, 20 minute show. Get your day started and it drops at 5 a.m. Monday through Friday. So check him out on all major podcast platforms. The Daily Answer. That's all the time we have for today. God bless.